Let me pray for you and then I can okay, run around. Yeah. <laughs> Holy Spirit, Jesus, thank you for Barry. We love everything that you've sowed in him and grown in him and that he spreads um, your word as he goes around. And we're just really looking forward to hearing a bit about your kingdom and your work through Barry and through the lens of how he sees the world. Thank you. Yeah. Bless you. So I'm going to give you that one. Yeah. Thank you. you. Stuff, you yeah. Do I have to leave this here? Because Mark will... Ah. Yeah, she'll move that there. All right. Um, I have got some props this morning. Um, I used to be a school teacher many years ago, and actually my first year of teaching, I taught at Dalesford prep class, which is five years of age, and in those days, teachers were real teachers. (laughs) Because I had 36 prep kids at the age of 21. Right? Can you imagine that? Well, you wouldn't want to imagine my class because the thing was that when you had 36 kids in a class, uh, they're in a line, four lines, I couldn't move, it took five minutes to move them from the mat into back to their seats because they're all jammed in and then you'd give them some exercise to do. It took so much effort that when the, we started at quarter to nine in those days, and the, the key is that play school was on at 9.30. So if I got them on the mat, I had 45 minutes on the mat and I did not have to move them. I could move them from the mat down the aisle to, to play school, which went to 10 o'clock. And then uh, um, the break in the class was at 10.15. Then I had 15 minutes to fill in, which I took them outside. And there was a part of the playground that was... No kids were allowed to play on, unless there was a teacher there, right? So I would take them on the part they weren't allowed to play on, which is all this bush, and had tracks through it, so we'd play follow the leader for the next 10 minutes, and when the bell went, you said, play time, and they dispersed. So I got maximum 20 minutes break for that. Anyway, that's a long story to tell you, (laughs) that the key was show and tell. Has anyone here got something to show us this morning? Um, Adam, I think you've got something to show us. What have you bought today, Adam? Uh, As you know, I'm a bit of a fan of toys. And um, I thought thought I'd bring along one of my toys out of my... What is that? What is that, Adam? Now, you, now you want to hold. You can't. Mic. You can't. You can't light that in the classroom. Just let you know that. Right? No. Yeah, yeah. It's a. It's a butane torch that um, tradies will use on the job. Electricians, plumbers, to do their different jobs. Yeah. Oh, wow, I, I inherited it from my father, who was an electrician. All right. Now I use it to light campfires when I go out in the. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually might have another use for that in a moment. You just stand over there, young man. Um, young Dave. Where's young Dave? Dave over here, Dave McCullum. He bought his... I've got his um, show and tell. I'll, I'll go and get... You want to come up, Dave, or not? You want, you're free. Uh, I'll go and get your show and tell. <laughs> no, please, can I let light it? <laughs> oh, the camera, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They need to be able to see. Well, this is Dave McClellan. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, well, mine's a real flamethrower. <laughs> you know, that little thing's a toy. This, <laughs> this thing will light you all up. <laughs> uh, but I'm not allowed to. <laughs> Um, so you'll just have to believe me that there's a big flame that comes out of here. Um. Thanks, Dave. Um, just behave yourself, all right? Um, I also bought a... Um, 
Yeah, no, don't behave yourself. Oh, I also, I also bought a show and tell for my for today, and it's over here. You know what this is? Oh, but that's well, you didn't comb your hair this morning, so I just fixed it up. All right. Now, this one is, a, you know what it is? A blow. I got this for my seventieth birthday. The kids wanted to buy me a um, Apple Watch. And I said, forget the Apple Watch, get me a blower, all right? Okay, now, put your thinking caps on, class. What do you think the topic might be today? We've got wind and we've got fire. Can anyone think what we might be going to talk about today? Who wants to have a go? Yeah. Arson? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now this is this is my this is supposed to be a message from the scriptures, but oh uh, yeah, yeah. Anyone else want to have a? It's pretty obvious. I think you just you know. Oh, Mount Carmel. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. Yeah. But oh yeah, my Pentecost. Where was wind? Ladies, <laughs> or <laughs> oh, and there was flames of fire. So, the question I've got for you: I've bought these props. They're not just props. Do you think that if I came and put the blower on these people along here, that the Holy Spirit would suddenly come and just slay everybody, and they would just go? Instead of having prayer, I just put the blower on. And my two helpers over here, you could walk around. Oh, yeah, I know, but don't worry about them. Yeah, I know. It's nice to have you here, but I just can't stand still. Um, you could go around and light a fire on everybody. If I can't light fire, everyone, can I sit down, sit down again? Yeah, you can. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so the question is... Are we good? You're good, yeah. Thank you. I just thought I'd bring it and I'd just have to do that and the Holy Spirit would just turn up. It hasn't happened. Well, I wasn't actually expecting that because there are certain ingredients for the Holy Spirit turning up. And we've got to look at them today. And the, I'd go number one is um, he actually wants to. He wants to turn up and it's free. Number one. Number two, he's looking for people who seek him. I don't just seek him once, but a continual heart of seek and seeking and seeking and seeking after him. Right. One, he wants to come. Two, a heart of seeking. And then he will come. But the wind blows where it will and we don't control that. I'd love to be able to control it with my blower. I, I could be a really good performer, I reckon, where I could strut across the stage and say, come Holy Spirit, and just, Poosh! and everyone would just go down. Oh, I can just see it. Uh, but that's a little bit easy, because it doesn't really require anything of our heart, right? He loves people. He is a good God who wants to give to us, and he's looking for people who are seeking him with soft hearts towards him, and he will come. That's the message today. So how we're going to do it is I'm, we're going to, I'm going to read scripture, Marg and I, a series of scriptures that I chose because I like them, right, about the Holy Spirit coming. And then I am going to just share a story from a book that's been written at the moment called... The um, unfolding story of a dreamer, right? So I'm actually going to read a story to you, then I have another scripture, and I'm going to read the next story, and that will be where I finish and where, well, not where God starts, because I'm praying that as you hear the scripture and you hear the story, it stirs something in your heart. That's all I'm looking for, right? That's all God. 
is he's stirring something in your heart that says, I want to seek you more. I want to know you more. And I absolutely trust you, God. And here I am, and you're, well, what are you going to do? I'm ready for you, right? Margaret, may you come? Lord, as we read your scripture, um, and we start with the prophetic from Isaiah, we start with the, then we have the fulfillment in Jesus Christ, then we have the promise coming of the Holy Spirit for those who follow you. Amen. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink. Even if you have no money. Come, take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. When he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. Keep on, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks... Receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who seek him? Oh, to those who ask him. (laughs) Now when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Oh, yeah. No, just... <laughs> Sorry about that. Was a... No, that was the sound. That's what they experienced. Yeah. <laughs> but more than that, <laughs> they saw what seemed to be happening. Sorry. Seemed to be tongues. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire. Where's the other one? <laughs> no. Wait, where's your other prop? Tongues oh, of oh, fire. Oh, okay. No, 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 no. No fire, no fire, no fire. No, sorry. No. <laughs> there seemed to be what... Okay. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then we move a little bit further on to the, uh, to the centurion. Different context. The Roman, where the Spirit comes. While Peter was still speaking these words, he was preaching that Jesus died on the third day, rose again, and we have eternal life. When Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the Spirit and I will also pray in words I understand. 
I will sing in the spirit. And I will also sing in words I understand. Father, thank you for your scripture. Thank you that it witnesses to your presence, to your power, to your love for us. And Lord, as we've heard these scriptures read, Lord, just speak to each one of us in terms of softening our heart to seek you. Softening our heart to your spirit, for we are spirit, you are spirit. Softening us, Lord, to, uh, to have a hope that is bigger than what we currently have. A hope in you, Jesus, that covers every sphere of our life, we pray. Amen. Thank, thank you, Mark. I was going to exegete those passages, <laughs> oh, but um, then I had come up with a different idea last week after um, this fellow here prayed for me. So I'll blame you, mate. Um, I thought, what I'll do is, I'll just tell my story that relates to those scriptures, that relates to seeking at a stage where I was particularly seeking God and, and seeking more of him, and then just what happened. And as I tell my story, my prayer is that you connect to it, that God speaks to you about you, who was totally different. So this is the unfolding story of a dreamer. The location is Bendigo, 1971-72. The age, I was 18 and I turned 19 in this period. Um, the story as I've written it is a tension between the man of the soil and the dreamer. So that's my sort of theme through this story. Um, the man of the soil is caught up with what needs to be done now, the expectations of what is expected of people and the need to provide and all that stuff. And the dreamer has this bigger possibility. The dreamer, he scores 100 before T, you know, in the dreams. In The man of the soil rarely achieves that, but it's good to dream this uh, other possibility. So that's a tension which might help with this story. So I'm now reading it to you. Um, I might need a... I might need one of those, I think, because I need to turn the page, yeah. So we're about 15 minutes before the play school, so it's story time, all right? <laughs> okay. So Bendigo, first year teacher's college. I'm 18. Making my way to, <clears throat> for the first time in a place where my family was unknown and I was a stranger, it was a new experience. About three weeks after starting college, a notice on the information board caught my eye. It read, <coughs> all invited, Christian Student Fellowship, Wednesday, 7.30, Student Lounge. I was intrigued. I had not yet many, met any other Christians in my short time at the college, but nor had I made an inquiry of anyone. My faith was still private. The following days, the invitation weighed on my mind. Should I go and find out who the other students were at the college who called themselves Christian? Before I needed to make that decision, another announcement caught my attention. The running of the annual cross-country race was to start in 30 minutes. Start in 30 minutes. I had missed the notice completely. A group of 20 young men warming up in their athletics outfit confirmed the fact that the race was about to start. I thought, I'll be in that. <laughs> I have shorts and a T-shirt in my gym locker. I didn't let the fact that I had no running shoes deter me. It was a dreamer inflicting his belief that all things were possible, even in the, if the practical evidence was stacked against him. The race was on. The field separated. And I surprisingly found myself in the lead bunch, except for a third-year student who just scooted away and was never seen again until he crossed the line. He ran professionally. Exuberance, however, can only get you one so far. And uh, as we move off the dirt and onto the bitumen, the bare soles of my feet 
told me that this was another good idea, badly thought through. <laughs> Maybe like preaching. No. Uh. <laughs> once again, the reality that um, so once again, the reality that we are people of the soil caught up with the infatuations of the dreamer. But determination can sometimes even bring a semblance of victory out of stupidity. In the vein of Winston Churchill, giving up had been installed in me as never an option. I held on to third spot. I made it onto the dais. I could hardly walk on my blistered feet and bloodied feet for the next week. But inwardly, I was satisfied. Indeed, very satisfied. In fact, satisfied enough to make it into my story, right? <laughs> nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'd thrown caution to the wind and suffered as a consequence, but in doing so, I'd given the dreamer a chance to achieve something extraordinary. A week later, I found myself gingerly walking up the driveway to the college. It was not the feet that were holding me back, but my uncertainty. I was wrestling with the question, did I really want to associate with these students who call themselves Christian? I had already made myself known to the cricket team. That was straightforward. This was completely different. I stayed in the shadows as I walked, keen for no one to see me. When a car unexpectedly came up the driveway, I hid upon a tree <laughs> until it passed. Very bold. The abandonment to reason and love of running that thrust me into the cross-country race was totally absent. But deep down, I felt a compulsion to keep going. This was a race that I knew I needed to enter at some time. It was a very apprehensive and unsure rookie who found the student lounge and joined nine other students. They were sitting... At, uh, anyone from the 70s will get this. They were sitting in a circle on the floor on beanbags and cushions singing folk songs to the strum of a guitar and the beat of a mongo drum. <laughs> Very cool. The welcome was warm, the atmosphere easygoing. They were gentle people, not loud or rude, and more women than men. I could not identify a footballer or a cricketer amongst them, except for one runner. He was a student who scooted away in the cross-country race, never to be seen again until he crossed the finish line. His presence gave me a little more assurance. The singing of Christian ballads was followed by a Bible reading. Two or three talked about what it meant and how it applied to their lives. I listened, amazed at their knowledge. I said nothing. The leader then said, we'll finish off with a time of prayer. This time we'll pray around the circle in turn. <laughs> I froze. I could not pray out loud. I had only ever prayed in my head. I had nowhere to hide. The level of intimidation built as each prayed in turn. The girl next to me said her amen. It was my turn. <laughs> Silence reigned. Words that resembled a prayer formed in my mind, but nothing came out. Eventually, my embarrassment was relieved by the young lady to my right. And so it played out for the rest of the year. I wondered if this was how it would always be for me. Despite my own feelings of inadequacy, I felt accepted and that I belonged. I was attracted by the individual and collective faith of these people. From the first night, I made sure the monthly meeting was firmly fixed in my diary. Nothing could keep me away. I was encouraged and challenged by my new friend's faith uh, and confidence God, in God. I also heard that the bongo player spoke in tongues. <laughs> I was unsure about that. He was the Christian that I admired the most. Near the end of the year, I gave God a simple request. Jesus, could you show me if there is more to this Christian life than what I already have. And if you not read the first five chapters, I thought that when I became a follower of Jesus, no church background, that it meant that I'd find one woman and live with her for the rest of my life. And I thought that was the only thing that was probably required of me. Otherwise, I'd live a normal life. 
right? <laughs> I find that's quite abnormal these days. But anyway, so in my mind I was thinking, is that all that is required from Jesus? Anyway, that's a back, back step. Was there any more? If there was not, I was okay with that. I was just asking. But if there was more, could Jesus, could you turn up in the next four months so I'm not left wondering? I need to plan my life. That was the deal. It wasn't an ultimatum. I was seeking clarity about what I could expect. It was seeking that brought me to the way in coffee shop. The way in coffee shop, just down the street from the famous Bendigo Central Fountain, was a place young people came to drink coffee, eat raisin toast and ask questions about Jesus. Large psychedelic posters hung on the walls declaring boldly that God is love and Jesus is the way. Can some people see those from the old days? Yeah. <laughs> One way. It was run by Jeff, the bongo player. <laughs> Jeff raised his voice above the murmur of the crowd and gave an invitation. Before we close tonight, he said, if anyone would like prayer, come to the back of the cafe and I will pray for you. A female student, I think she was keen on him, but I didn't put that in the story. <laughs> A female student I knew from the teacher's college uh, walked to the back. A second followed. Others finished their coffee and conversation and slowly ambled out of the shop. I remained in a corner, alone, observing and arguing with myself. Should I ask for prayer? Oh, you probably do that every Sunday. Anyway, <laughs> why do I need to have someone pray for me? Praying in my head worked for me before, so why change now? On the other hand, I'd ask God if there was more to know about how to live this Christian life. Perhaps this was the time. I decided to take a risk. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. This was a race worth running. By the time almost everyone was gone, I made my way back to the back of the coffee shop. I got down on my knees and I waited on God. I felt a gradual connection with Jesus while at the same time a disconnection between my mind and my body. It was some time later that Jeff appeared. He laughed when he saw me. Very unspiritual. I remember thinking he just laughed at me. And he said, you have come for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I wasn't sure why I'd come. <laughs> He placed his hand on my head and as he did, a powerful and personal presence moved from my head and down through my body. At this stage, I've never been to church yet, right? So I'm totally unchurched, which Mark says makes it much easier. Anyway. <laughs> as he did, a powerful and personal presence moved from my head down through my body. A deep peace came over me. It relaxed both my soul and my body. Then I felt an uncontrollable joy bubbling up within me. The bubbling was replaced by a surge of emotion, which I didn't do, by the way. It was joy, pure joy. An insatiable desire to worship God overcame me. My voice box, which had previously been muted when praising God, because I only did it in my head, was let loose. For the first time in my life, I found myself praying aloud. <laughs> it was not a conscious effort. I simply could not contain the words. Jesus, you're so good. Jesus, you are everything. Jesus, you're my Lord and my King. Jesus, I love you. The presence of God kept whelming up wave after wave. I lost the sense of having a physical body. The safest place was on my back on the floor. <laughs> Words turned to song. Songs in English turned to songs in a heavenly language. It only seemed like minutes, but after I returned in time and space as I knew it, Jeff filled me in on the picture. You've been off with God for over an hour, he said. <laughs> then he added with a laugh and singing in perfect harmony. This was impossible. 
I could not hit a tune any time of day. As for tongues, it was not what I had imagined. You know, a sidestep from the story. Um, a couple of weeks before, I, I heard about tongues, so I tried it out. So I got up at three o'clock in the morning, got beside my bed on my knees, I thought, on my knees is a good place with God, and went, ah, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. no, nothing. I'll try again. So I made some more sound, ah, ah, oh, ah, uh, and gone, nothing there. So I jumped back in the bed, perfectly happy and very pleased with myself that I had an effort. I made an effort, right? So I was trying to make words but didn't work. What was completely different with this is that I don't remember the tongues, but I just remember this desire to worship God. And the tongues was the expression of this. And when you read those scripture readings, now I'm preaching, I should get back to the story. When it comes in Acts, it comes said, it said uh, the wind and the flame came, then they spoke in tongues, and it says, and they glorified God, or and they praised God. So we might fuck on the tongues, but and they praise God. In when it comes to the to the centurion, to the Gentiles, they speak in tongues, direct consequence of that was, and they praise God. The chief purpose of man is to enjoy God, what is it? Glorify God and enjoy God forever. And then I realized, oh, tongues was about worship. Right. Anyway, that's the preaching part. That's what you missed out on because I'm telling the story. <laughs> this is better. The story's better. Jeff closed up the coffee shop much later than he had planned. I ran home, foregoing the footpath for the tram tracks down the middle of Carpenter Street. Anyone know Carpenter Street? Leaping, clicking my heels. I could do that in those days. I could <laughs> both together, hands in the air. Punching the air and praising God. I was exhilarated. I was free. The Holy Spirit had taken me into another realm, as if I were joining with the angels to sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. For that hour, the world of the soil had completely faded away. This could not be explained to a person set in the soil. For the dreamer, it did not need to be explained. It was simply treasured for the experience that it was. It seemed good to me. I kept this experience private in the same way as I had when Jesus answered my prayer a little over two years before. What happened that night was between God and me. That's why I'm, we had that prayer time the other day. I said, I'm letting out my secrets when I write The Journey of a Dreamer. I'm not sure what I'll do with that. Anyway, what happened that night was between God and me. It was not something I could nor felt I should explain to others. However, the Bible came more alive to me and I had a joy in my heart and a skip in my step that was incessant. I devoured whatever books I could on the Holy Spirit and what this strange gift of speaking in tongues was. It was then that I came across a thick scholarly book that gave its whole thesis to refuting what I had experienced. The writer argued that speaking in tongues all ceased with the apostles. His logical conclusion was that any such occurrence today was a counterfeit from Satan. Wow. I'm still not in church or anything. I'm on my own working this out, right? I'm not quite. This tossed everything on its head. I had no doubt he was a Christian. So to draw such conclusions confused me. For the first time, I became unsure about what I'd experienced. Was it God? Was it the devil? Was it just a psychological phenomena? Was it good or was it bad? The internal discussion could not have been so, would not have been so bad if it remained academic. But my whole countenance took a battering and a deep despair took over. My joy disappeared and the skip of my step had no bounce. The dark mood took me to a place I'd never been before and consumed me for, this is a good part, about an hour. <laughs> I didn't want it. My despair compelled me to run 20 minutes to Jeff's place to get his advice. 
I knock on the door. It's dinner time. And Jeff opened it. Standing on the door, I blurted out, Jeff, can speaking in tongues be from the devil? He answered me by asking a few questions. Do you love the scriptures more? My answer was a resounding, yes. Do you love Jesus more? Yes. Are you more able to love and forgive others? Yes. Then what are you worried about? (laughs) My answer was unequivocal, absolutely nothing. (laughs) Jeff returned to his meal and I ran back home shouting and leaping and praising God. The dark mood was immediately replaced with joy and freedom and an overwhelming sense of privilege it was to know Jesus. It was the darkest hour in my short two years of romance between the spirit and the dreamer. It was an experience a dreamer would never forget and never want to go back to. The dark world without God simply sucked all the dreams away. The giver of dreams, which is my term for God, as well as the old man up top, they're my two favoured terms for God, The giver of dreams spoke of a different future, one full of hope, adventures and companionship. The journey was just beginning. Story number one. Now, my prayer is that something in that story lights up something for you, right? Because it's just my story, but you said it beautifully. We all have our own story. But the same spirit and the same desire to seek him and trust him that he's a good God, remains. One more scripture, then the next story, and then I finish, right? Because this moves on now. So that one is really about tongues given as a gift to absolutely glorify and worship God. And I would say since that time, I would say six days in every seven in a week, I would pray in tongues from that day. (laughs) And probably six out of seven is conservative. It might be more often, right? Because for, it, it was because of the way I experienced God in that. And it's, it's my way of worshipping him, right? Sometimes I get the use of tongues that's tied up to how the church operates. But anyway, that's, that's a different topic. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for believers in harmony with God's own will. So this is a story where I found this to be true. So it's um, Bottom Camp and uh, Barunga out of Catherine Aboriginal community. Marg and I were living in uh, 1986. 33, three children, six and down, which would explain why the start of this book was a story is problematic. It was time to begin the evening routine, dinner, story time, and then to put the three children to bed. Life is determined by habits, and habits are hard to break. Tonight I was feeling uneasy. My intuition was interfering with life's practice. I told Marg my thoughts. I want to go for a walk around the camp for some reason. I have this strong sense. I think it's a God thing. I usually say I think it's a hunch, which means the same thing in my language. Marg knew how unusual it was. Her husband was not a person to stroll around the camp looking for company for no apparent reason. She was more the extrovert. If you think you should go, then by all means go, Marg said. I wandered, leaving her with the three kids, I wandered down towards the camp in the direction I was most familiar. The majority of houses were spread out on two sides of the oval. The better houses for the white staff and the the council members, Aboriginal council members, were in a separate section up the hill behind uh, wire fencing. I took the dirt road that headed out towards the back of the camp. I'd not walked this track before. The community itself was unusually quiet. I wondered where the people were. I did not have to wait long. A further 100 metres down the track, I saw a large gathering in an open area. As I got closer, I could see cars parked with their lights on and people sitting on blankets. Together they formed a large U-shape. It was about 50 metres across and 100 metres deep. 
Campfires were scattered around the perimeter, providing warmth against the freshness of the dry season night. I was drawn towards the gathering. I recognised some of the Christian mobs sitting some distance away. Across the other side of the field, but within the field, was a single small fire. I recognised my friend Jimmy sitting alone on a rug. So you've got the big circle, one fire, one chair, a rug. 100 metres deep, right? It's like a football oval, people watching. On a plastic chair in the middle of the field was his wife, Queenie. A lone man with a large cowboy hat and large frame stood next to Queenie. There was no one else in the 50 metre by 100 metre space. Without missing a step, I leisurely walked across the 50 metre field towards Jimmy. I was aware that all eyes were on this white man, only white man there, intruding into blackfella business. No one was expecting this, me included. My mind was racing. I was in unknown territory. I sat down on the rug next to Jimmy. I now had some cover as I observed all that was around me. The stillness was eerie. I struggled to put a finger on it, then realised the constant sound of squabbling and barking dogs was absent. Now, if anyone's lived in an Aboriginal community, if the dogs are not barking, something's going on. I asked Jimmy, what's going on? I put these in the wrong water, Mark. Or maybe I just left the pages out, didn't print them, so I can tell you. What's going on? Um, and he said, well, he said to me, um, hang on, I'll just uh, do my own, what's going on? Okay. Jimmy said, Queenie's gone long, long for the last week. Uh, she's gone crazy. Right. And the clever Bella man, He's come to heal her, otherwise known as the witch doctor, right, we would use, right? I, I, and, and I did my own reasoning through this and gone, well, you've got to do something if you're sick. Um, the, the part I've left out is what went through my mind is when I looked at the Clever Bella man, all I said was a human. He's a fellow human like me. Don't deem him a witch doctor, deem him a human who's trying to do something to help the poor lady who's sick. And for generations, what do you do? That's what you do. So read it as compassion here, not as a fight between light and darkness. That's my logic. That's, that's what I go through because I don't know, how, I mean, I'm in foreign territory, right? Some may seem the tool of Satan bringing deception, but right now, it was not for me to decide. I sat observing everyone. One last spray of water. I did it. It was brilliant. Uh, she sat on the seat, and he would walk. Uh, sorry, folks. I'm just walking this way. He would back head up. He would walk like this. <laughs> and then he put a hand on a head like this. Look at her. And then off. And he... <laughs> back again. Struck back. And then the last one. One last spray. He's had a bottle of, had a billy can of water. He put his mouth. He put his head up against her forehead. <laughs> and spray the water away. It was really impressive. I was very impressed. One last spray of water and he wound back the performance. Jimmy rose from the blanket next to me and walked over to the Clever Bella man. They spoke. Jimmy returned and sat next to me. He explained. The rainbow serpent entered her head when she was down at the water hole last week. He could see small holes in her head where it entered. It was swirling around inside her head, sending her crazy. Is she going to be better, Jimmy? I asked. He doesn't know. 
he didn't think he was able to make it go. A number of men were now standing with the witch doctor. He came over to me. I stood up. We shook hands politely, acknowledging each other. Two clever bella men in our own way of thought, I thought to myself. I knew the meeting of the missionary and the witch doctor was breaking convention. But I was not writing the script. I said to him, I will pray for Queenie. He nodded in approval and replied with a affirming voice, that would be good. His task was done. According to Jimmy, he was rewarded $400 for his service and a carton of beer. He, I wasn't sure if I should put that in the book. That's true. I was just trying to... I want everyone to be seen in a good light, but we pay a lot more for doctors who do less. So anyway... Yeah. His performance was worth every cent. <laughs> Queenie moved from the chair and sat on the blanket next to me beside the fire. I sat silently weighing up the situation... From her perspective, I concluded, the clever metal man has left her in worse position than she was before. He has identified the problem but not solved it. Can I pray for you? I asked. You I, she replied. I knew I was to I knew I was to pray, but I had no idea what to pray. Should I pray on the prognosis of the witch doctor? Queenie may believe that. But why should I accept his prognosis? The picture of me boldly casting out a rainbow serpent that was not there amused me. <laughs> it would be a performance in Jesus' name to match the witch doctor. It would be equally ineffective. I thought about the safe option. Why not simply pray peace and comfort on Queenie? I scolded myself. It was too tame and too lame, given the circumstances. Praying with the mind was becoming complicated. I was out of my depth. You might know where this is going. You probably do. I looked at Queenie and was struck by her forlorn figure. I felt Jesus' love for her. It was time to pray. I moved alongside Queenie and said, I'm going to pray for you in another language that God has given me. The Holy Spirit will be talking to your spirit. Is that okay with you? Queenie nodded her head. I began to pray very quietly and gently in tongues, not raising my voice or making any grand gestures. The words came, were soothing and rhythmic and each syllable fully articulated. So I could, I could model that, but I just noticed it was sort of like, I can hear myself. It was more like, and it was just... Right. Quinny was the only one who heard it. The words were just between us. I sensed the peace coming over Queenie and was grateful for that. I was not looking for a battle with an aggrieved spirit or public confrontation between the forces of light and darkness. I concluded my prayer with a blessing in Creole and the liturgical safety net. I ask this in Jesus' name, Amen. I felt better for that. Um, the dogs were now barking and fighting. People were in conversation and cars were driving away. Queenie looked up at me and thanked me with a smile. I shook hands with Jimmy, sitting just a few metres away. We agreed we should catch up again soon. I walked back home along the dirt road, wondering what it all meant. What would my handshake with the witch doctor mean to those who observed it? Just human respect, I hoped, and not endorsement. Then there was the comparison between the grand performance that silenced the community and my gentle prayer that was hidden away in a corner. I waited up. A thought flashed through my mind. Get over yourself. This has nothing to do with you or the witch doctor. It's all about Jesus' love for Queenie. A week later, we met again under the tree where Marg held her Creole reading sessions. 
Jimmy's son, or his nephew really, had been transferred to Royal Adelaide Hospital Renal Unit. Jimmy told me he was homesick for his family and country. I suggested they record a message for him on my cassette recorder and I would post it to him. They were now ready to do that. Queenie was no longer the lethargic figure of the previous week. She was alert and ready to share her story. I placed the microphone in front of her and she began to talk in Creole. The speed of the language made it difficult for me to follow. Queenie's storytelling was in full swing. I imagined how sweet it would sound to Jimmy's homesick son um, in Adelaide. I then heard her talk about being really sick. I listened intently. In the flow of Creole, I deciphered a single sentence that caught my attention. I thought I heard her say, Did your missionary ear be pray by me and straight away that sickness been going now? <laughs> Had I heard her right? I didn't know. When she finished recording, we sat quietly for some time. My curiosity needed to be satisfied. I asked her, Did you say the sickness went away when I prayed for you? <laughs> Almost in disbelief. Now that's that's just who I am, all right. Queenie was puzzled by my uncertainty. Queenie reported, when you prayed for me, the sickness went away. Jesus healed me straight away. She was adamant. I felt slightly rebuked. The, her smile that farewelled me when I walked away that night, and her smile now, should have been sufficient confirmation. Whatever was said when I prayed in tongues would remain a mystery to me. But one thing was certain. It communicated very clearly in the heavenlies and to whatever and whoever was causing the problem. I turned to Jimmy and asked, how do you think Quinny was healed from his sickness? He replied, with a sense of relief in his voice, I don't know. I'm just happy that she's better. End of story. Now, Anita, when we were praying before the, this um, service, Anita had a picture and I said, this picture that Anita had was actually what I was trying to communicate through these stories and the Bible reading. So Anita will come and share this and then we can have ministry after that, okay? God is good. It's all free. Seek him. Knock on the door. He's ready to open it. And the Holy Spirit is given to all. So I just had a, a picture in the prayer before the service and I didn't know what Barry was talking on, but it was, we were all just playing in the creek down the bottom of um, this creek bed and just enjoying what's there um, with a little trickle of water, a little trickle of, of fun that we were enjoying. And upstream, um, the boulders were moved um, and the rush of the Holy Spirit or the rush of the water was coming down and it saturated us in his love and so I felt like it was about God saying he really wanted to saturate us today in his love um, and his Holy Spirit. Um, there's more um, that's what's available to us other than the trickle that we play in. Um, and so that was the picture that I got. There, um, I hand over to you, but there was one thought when these people were singing before, I think it was How Great Thou Art, not How Great Thou Art, second last song, okay. How Great Is Our God, that sometimes in worship like that, for me it was like suddenly I ran out of words, that if there's any time just for a short worship that may be something that people respond to, um, you can go, if God's given you a heavenly language or you would like to speak just let it happen in worship, right? There's many ways God does this. We don't control and the spirit comes and goes as he will. But that was a thought I had. Now I pass on to you, Di. Did you think to do some singing now? Is that I, what you Well, I thought that could be an activation for the spirit. Yeah, cool. But then we all want to pray with people too. Yeah, yeah. all right. So maybe um, guitarist Simon, worship leader, would you like to respond to that and just get yourself ready? How good was that? Right? Wow. Thank you, Barry. What we don't realise is sitting in the midst of this amazing community are stories, not from only the past, but Barry during COVID started to write his story. And there's a number of you right now that are writing your story because we need to tell our stories. 
because God's been doing amazing stuff in your lives. And so today it's about the Holy Spirit coming upon us in a fresh way. And if you were here three weeks, I think it was, ago, exactly what Barry described happened for Ronnie. Ronnie, right? Stand up, Ronnie. I'm not going to make you do anything. Just that, Do you remember Ronnie was standing there next to Graham and in the midst of worship someone had talked about... Um, <clears throat> Tongues just coming out of praise, and that happened for you for the first time right here. You right? Thank you. So all this is what God's just weaving this together, that he's wanting us to experience more than we know. And so would you like to stand with us?